Aaron, or it says Corey. Should I say I'm Corey Munson coming to you from Iowa? Because that's what's in the script. But uh, I'm Aaron Castro coming to you live from Phoenix. Got uh, Victor Perez hanging out in the east. And then Liam Madigan is even far east. And then Josh is in Denver. And our producer Corey's hanging out in, you know, the cornfields of Iowa. So how's everyone's week been? It's been good. Yes, Slow. it's work. Just, it, yeah. just boring, awesome. Huh? So, so nothing, so nothing happened this weekend. Yeah. That's what you're no, nothing I, important. I think, as, as I recall, Victor slept in over the weekend, so I guess uh, I was kind of following his lead. That is ah. true. <laughs> that is. I true. got sunburned. That that was my weekend. I got sunburned and I couldn't lie down and be comfortable at any point. Oh, well, I, I guess I was the only one that did something. So I went to a U7s tournament. And uh, oh, that's, that's what you did. We were wondering what you were doing this weekend. <laughs> yeah, so was first to say it. I, drove, I drove all the way to California to, to watch a Tournament of Flags, which is a stop on the – So this is intense. SoCal Youth Rugby has a seven series. They have, they have a seven series, not just – like one tournament in the summer, but they've got like five tournaments. And this is the biggest one. It's called, I guess it's only in the second year. Tournament of Flags takes place around 4th of July, of course. And they had almost a thousand kids Wow! play at this tournament on Saturday. That's great. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, California's always had pretty good numbers for rugby, you know, hence the PRP. Yeah, I, I mean, so they're, they're crushing it with youth rugby, and that's really why – you know, one of the reasons why SoCal has gotten, you know, two matches in uh, – oh, well, actually three matches in – well, no, just two. I don't know why I'm thinking three. But Argentina 15 – well, three, yeah, 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 because of the Chile match. So SoCal got – Make up your mind there. Dang, yeah. The SoCal got the Canada test last summer for qualifiers, and then we had – uh, you know, the Argentina 15 match in at StubHub and the Chile match at Fullerton. So um, great stuff there. But the reason for my visit was to go meet uh, and have a chat with Stuart Proctor, which there is some information I can share, and we'll get to that in the views, news, and abuse section. But really why I was in San Diego, of course, was to attend the Major League Rugby final. Uh, at Torero Stadium, which uh, hats off um, and props to uh, the San Diego Legion uh, event team. Uh, Nikki Pena from the media side, you know, she made it a smooth transition for all media involved. And then, uh, you know, Matt Hawkins, uh, president and general manager for, you know, getting everything together and running that ship. Uh, it was a great time. They hosted, you know, the Glendale Raptors and the Seattle Seawolves for the inaugural uh, raising of the America's Championship Shield. So, but so that's what I did. Um, but did you guys watch the match, or was was I the only one that um, did that? There was uh, a rugby match. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that important. I was watching the Canadian Football League on Saturday. That's a thing uh, you do. I, I actually I was uh, tuned into CBS Sportsnet for Arena Football and. Uh, <laughs> All of anyone, when this rugby way. thing comes on, yeah, it just pops on out of nowhere. I definitely wasn't angrily tweeting at uh, CBS <laughs> Sportsnet when uh, the game went over. Has anybody noticed how, like, I, okay, I'd never watched Arena Football in my life until like two or three weeks ago, last time they preempted an MLR game. But like the last sixty seconds of those damn things go on forever. It's stupid. Yeah, so it's sort of. the same thing in any sport, to be honest. It, it, it just like. turns into a shootout no matter what. There's no more – there's no ground and pound in arena football. It's just well, like – you, you, you got three offensive linemen. There's only really <laughs> so much you can do. Uh, but uh, so did the game come on on time? Uh, so the game itself came on on time because – it was actually uh, the start wasn't until about maybe quarter or twenty after uh, eight. Okay, my time, uh, the hour there. So the fact that it was five minutes delayed by Arena Football wasn't a big deal. Uh, I think they may have just cut back a little bit on their pre-show stuff, and uh, they had plenty of buffer time built in. So it worked out fine. 
but it definitely was a little uh there's a little heartburn at first when i thought that uh kickoff was going to be at 805 or something and uh we were missing it watching these guys running back and forth inside a room well i i did they do i think they do do the pregame that way because they know they have live sports before them so they have that buffer built in yeah so that they don't have to miss anything yeah because again go ahead victor yeah, I was gonna say because again didn't start in until nine twenty or so, in my time. Nice. So yeah, so about twenty after the hour. So you were you at a rugby pub? Mm. No, I didn't. I didn't go to. I actually stayed home. I got lazy and I said, you know why, what? Why didn't you support the pig and whistle, New York? Uh, I, I, bro, it's because I live in Brooklyn and I didn't want to go forty minutes there and back and get home by twelve. So I was lazy. I can, was just can, can I just have? One complaint before we really get into this, please. Let's um, go. Who who decided to put all of the rugby one on one stuff into the middle of the fucking game? Uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. right. Like, I like, mean, right I guess I guess instead of uh, commercials during water breaks, they uh, they did some you know special content. Although I will point out, uh, you know, I, I'll probably uh, talk to Pete and Dan Power this week. Uh, about uh, Stacy as a hooker, uh, she did not hook the ball back. She like kicked it out to the side. That was not cool. Well, all right. So <laughs> the ma- the main complaint I think a lot of people had was that it was during play. Like oh, when yeah. the when the Sea Wolves scored their first try, I believe they did the line out one right before they threw the line out. <laughs> like I think they thought Scott Green was going to call the break, but when he didn't, like you don't think you can stop that. I don't know. There's just, I mean, you're trying to run uh, a production company to do rugby to the American fan base. But I think there were only like two water breaks the entire game that I saw uh, being there, which, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was still pretty hot. Like uh, when I ended up leaving and going with my brother and sister-in-law to the bar uh, in North Park, uh, I was sweating my balls off. <laughs> it was it was still hot. I was like, "Geez, uh, you know, uh, Torero in July is uh, you know not you know not nice." And so uh, it's it's better than Phoenix, but um, <laughs> yeah. So so that's what I got uh, as far as that is concerned. So guys, let's start the show proper. So oh, really? Is the show not started yet? <laughs> oh, we're just we're just. I know. We're just, I mean, we've got one topic to go over, so I think we kind of just <laughs> slid right into it. Okay, so Sea Wolves win, Seattle, together we hunt, hashtag, uh, 23, hashtag to 19, 23 to 19 over Glendale Raptors, and Raptors ready went down. Uh, did, did this match feel weird to anyone else? Uh, the fact that the the Raptors didn't do what they were supposed to do, uh, that which was win, what all of us thought. Well, all of you guys, besides me, uh, I went and I went see Wilson and won. But in any case, um, <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's, what, that's that's what felt weird really, to me. That's not really what I meant because I was there, and I was wondering if what I saw there translated over to the broadcast, and I finally caught up on it today, and it just. Did you guys think that Glendale played really tight? Well, I mean, I think they played really aggressively. You know, I, it, you know, it depends what you mean by tight. I think they were able to get like, to so, Glen- like you wound up like a jack in the box. Explosive? Yeah. No, like as in they tried to do too like much. They were, yeah, they 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 played. I mean, I want to say they played like crap, but I feel there's a difference to me between playing, you know, poorly and just playing wound tight, uh, where they're not able to, you know, express themselves and they're like really under pressure mentally. Because well, you you could kind of see it when they got around the edge and they had those little breaks near the uh near the sideline and they were trying to do the fancy offload passes when they all they needed was just a simple pass and so this plays into you know what 
some of the, some stats that play into what I'm asking. Uh, they conceded 12 penalties, and Seattle. Think about this. Before this game, and I think even with the penalties they had, I think they had seven or eight. Uh, they or Seattle was the most penalized team in the league. But in this game, Glendale conceded more penalties, and then you look at the handling errors. <laughs> Okay, so the stat sheet that I got says that they had 14 handling errors, but I, I'd say it had to be close to closer to 20. It was it was not good. Well, I think we got to break it down to what the bare facts are. Uh, Glendale does not do well in California, at least on two games. Uh, I'm not sure what's with San Diego, but is there something in the water over there or what? But yeah. It was not pretty. So I think I think it can be chalked up to when you say when you say they were playing tight. I think you can kind of chalk that up to them trying to play a bit more conservatively. I think Glendale saw themselves as the better team going into this, and they 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 were probably under the impression that if they could play, uh, you know, just a very tight game of rugby and not try to do anything extra, that it would just kind of fall into their favor. The only thing is though is they kept on making mistakes and they weren't playing a, a kind of they weren't playing a kind of game that allowed them to be explosive, that allowed them to be creative, like you said. And, you know, Seattle is very well known for de defense. They were able to kind of quell any kind of attack that Glendale tried to get going. And they just weren't – they weren't playing fast enough. They Like uh, like you guys were saying, they weren't allowed to be themselves. They weren't allowed to be the team that we saw all season. I, you, I, you look at how Dave Williams has coached this team and you look at how he prepares this team. And I want to say uh, Belichickian as you know some people say but he's very good at taking away strengths and for the most part the raptors just run right until they played that game against uh san diego and just you know <laughs> got run out but is it is it me or something i'm i'm writing something introspective on how the sea wolves you know sort of won it, it doesn't really delve deep into each game but more or less you know the preseason and the season but I guess it's it wasn't that the Sea Wolves struggled with the Raptors. They were supposed to lose, right, in those games. But it was the Raptors that struggled with the Sea Wolves, if that makes sense, right? Because the first game they only won by five points, and then the second game, you know, if <laughs> if uh, if the Sea Wolves play better for another five minutes, it's probably not, you know, 11 to zero and then flip the switch. It's, you know, 20, 25 to zero uh, in Glendale at home for in favor of the Seawolves. And, you know, we're talking a different game there. So what are your guys' thoughts there? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, kind of like Corey said, it's obviously – Playing a different, it's obviously playing a different game for uh, Glendale whenever they go down to San Diego, and I think there's something to be said too for kind of how, how the schemes of, uh, of each team matches up whenever they do go on the road. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then you know the comment from uh, you know a viewer said is like the Raptors fail to play to their ability, or did the Sea Wolves succeed in shutting them down? I think both things happened. Uh, I, was, you know, I was gonna I, say it's definitely a combination of the both because I think I think the Raptors like I, like I said they went in with a specific game plan to try to play a bit more conservatively but I think Seattle came in with a with a game plan of applying as much pressure as possible and that pressure forced the mistakes uh, you know you know from this yeah. what was supposed to be a more conservative game plan because we you look at how the what the Sea Wolves did and I looked at the stats uh, wow. Uh, the tackle differential compared to each, uh, the uh, missed tackles are roughly similar, but they forced, the Seabulls forced the Raptors to make, I think it was the first time the Raptors had to make, no, I think it was the second time the Raptors had to make over 100 tackles in a game uh, this season, which says a lot. So they figured out how to just pound the ball in the center of the field and then use, you know, their big running centers, center like uh, William Razaleka, and just force double tackles. Because double tackles, you talk about what that means. Well, uh, for for some teams, it can be 
you know, you want to double tackle so you punish the ball carriers and tire them out. But for the attacking team, you want to also force double tackles when you've got really big physical runners to tire out the defense, which is what I think occurred over this game. I, I also think one key contributing factor was um, the Raptors started um, Chad London and Bobby Dice. And when Atta Malifa came on, I think that's when Seattle started to take advantage because no offense to Atta, he's a great player, but he's just not as physical of a player. And I think that's when Seattle really started to take advantage and started running at him, and that's when they started finding gaps. So, so Josh, you've been you followed the Raptors for a long time. Do you think center behind fly half is their uh... – is now their uh, shallowest position. I mean, it's, well, it is now because Bryce Bryce is, uh, you know, going to play with Irish next year. Um, I, well, Mika uh, Kruse has been playing on the wing, but I think he can be a good center. I think he needs maybe put on a little bit more weight. He definitely um, has the height for it. Yeah, definitely. He's, 6'2", 210 right now. Because Kruse is really a fly half, really, and to put him on the wing. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen that man kick once this year, so uh, he may have been a fly half in high school, but he's <laughs> playing a ton in the centers and a ton on the wing, and he's been great in you know playing in the centers and playing in, on the wing, but I think it's just – you're talking about Adam Malifa. Adam Malifa is, you know, old man. Uh, he's yeah, played great – he's played a lot of great rugby for the Raptors, but – I'm Eagle. I, I don't – I'm not. It's not on him. I just think that they uh, they didn't play to their abilities, but I think they were forced into that by uh, the Sea Wolves. And one of the things uh, I know the stat sheet said says something about lineouts, but I I was right there watching these lineouts, and you know the Raptors stole like four or five of the Sea Wolves lineouts, but they didn't do anything with those stolen possessions. Didn't do shit. Like they tried to go into a mall every time, and it got stopped. But two of their tries did come off of malls, though. Well, uh, well, of course. But I mean, but those, were their, those were those were their own lineouts, and they were in good field position. The ones I was at were like in the midfield uh, on the uh, north side of the stadium, and it was just like you're, you're gaining these possessions, and and nothing is happening. It just seemed like. Nothing Nothing really worked for them. Uh, another stat was they conceded seven turnovers at the breakdown to Seattle's two. So I think part of – you can – I'll call me biased, whatever. I do live in Colorado. Try not to be biased. But it, Scott Green kind of called it a little not, – not much. I don't think it made that much of a difference. But it almost seemed like he was calling stuff different for Seattle than he did for Glendale. Well, I mean, not not to really tack onto the officiating. I think he's been beat. I think Scott's been beat up a lot. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm, this this one. No, this is this is something I got. We talked. I think uh, I sort of talked. We didn't talk about it last week, but you and I talked about it in Glendale. Mm-hmm. They're just missing stuff. Yeah, they are just missing stuff. The elbow, I I think he called that penalty because it didn't make make um, Cam Paulson dropping knees. Um, I mean there was plenty of stuff that both t- both teams pulled some stuff that could have been called that wasn't called, but it did kind of seem like they, the ref refereeing was a little off. Specifically, the scrum half on scrum half crime that was. Uh... <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't see an issue with that. <laughs> no, it's like they they were they were getting at it and they were getting it physical happens. and they kept it amongst themselves and it wasn't wasn't crazy violent. I was like, good. That, that's that's how I want to that's how I want to see that occur. Um, this is the closest thing to a WWE match the MLR has seen all season. <laughs> you, you know, it, it, th- I think this was the match for me. This was the match really determined who the top top scrum half in the league was. Um, and there's one right, match. When it came, when it came down to it, uh, you know, Mac won. 
and, and like these are the two top scrum halves in the league, and they're both field generals. Uh, one, you know, Sean is the captain. Phil's not, but he's the head coach, and he's having to figure this out. <laughs> he's mm-hmm. like, it's like they coach a little bit by committee, but he's the head coach, and he's on the pitch. He's trying to like just guide everything, and it's just uh, it, I. Uh, so I, I guess we beat up uh, Glendale a lot, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the Seawolves and what they did. Uh, so we talked about how Glendale usually tries to take away your uh, your way of life. Well, the Seawolves did that to the Raptors. They crushed they 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 made that kicking game worthless. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with. Uh, either Matt Turner running out of the backfield or using his foot or Peter Smith. I, where has Peter Smith been all season? I, I it has to be, uh, you know, he had to just not be fit during most of the season and which was well, why he played off the bench when he did. But I thought Brock Stoller, he was in the concussion protocol. I thought that was a big loss, but it wasn't because you had Smith. Yeah. He missed some kicks uh, at mm-hmm. goal. But where he was able to put the ball, he was able to put the ball places that Will McGee just whiffed on. Or, you know, Turner was able to put the ball in places that Deashimal couldn't. And I think their their feet are, they're, are about the same, really, uh, when it comes to where they can put the ball. It was just, uh, you know, picking where to put it. Speaking of kicking, guys, let's agree to to never have Billy Tolutau kick a ball ever again. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my goodness! And you know, I could not agree more. <laughs> Eric, I could, I, I could not, I, you know what? Right, so you know what? You know, so what? you know what? You know what? I could not agree more with Dan Power when he said, and that's why you were saying that it went to the the soccer World Cup. I could not agree more with Dan Power when he said that. Oh but my no, goodness! I, but nobody's like, gonna remember because he got that MVP. So <laughs> yes, that is so true. No, no it's like I was like. Shame, shame, shame. And then it's like <laughs> his his man that was bad. That that was oh really bad. The 70 <laughs> minute shift and- that Billy Tolutau put in the middle of the pitch, jackaling balls, forcing turnovers. Oh my gosh. Like my goodness. That's not, that's how they're doing Maui. That is how they do it in my no, way. No offense to uh, – I want to say no offense to Philly Mac and Cheese, but how about Phil Mac's decision to kick that ball at one point when uh, Seattle had some really good <laughs> momentum and they were putting some pressure on Seattle at one point, and uh, he for some reason decided to, uh, to try to, you know, puff kick the ball like, uh, like o- over Glendale's defensive line and okay, it ended up going nowhere in range of, for any of his guys to get it. I, I got to say that the box kicking in this game – from both of those dudes was atrocious. Like, like you know, that Davies is at midfield. He's got the midfield. He's got he's got the chance to go wide, uh, and he just brings in the forwards to set up the ruck so he can box kick. And guess what? Mac does the same crap. And I was like, Ugh. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know. One of the questions, I guess, on the board from our uh, viewer, uh, Stephen, loving the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, did Billy commit a penalty? Yes. Mm-hmm. I, my, my, my point of view, it's only because Sequoia Burke Combs ran an inside line. If he had run an I inside mean, line, it wouldn't have been called. Mm-hmm. If, if, the ball right. goes, if the ball goes out, instead of being flipped inside, right? Mm-hmm. Or... So, we, I mean, it was flipped inside, but if, if the ball goes out or Sequoia, Sequoia Burke Combs runs an outside line, it's not an obstruction. No. But he ran inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a penalty. I mean, straight up. He uh, wasn't but, looking ahead of him either. But I, so. I, I did not, like, that was not clear to the fans in the stadium. Mm-hmm. Like, that was not well communicated to the booth and then announced out which I think is something to, uh, you know, so we have our, our rest mic to uh, the television. I think mm-hmm. one of the things for next year is to, uh, when they call a penalty like that, uh, when they're using TMO, they need to be right mic'd up to the PA system or, uh, you know, the announcer needs to 
it needs to be in his um, you know, in his headphones so he can then push it out to the PA system. Because I was trying to figure that out, and I didn't know what the deal was until I watched the game today. Mm. See? There you go. Glendale had that for Austin when they played the first game, but didn't use it in any of their other matches. Like, they had, they had I think it was Chris Asmus did the Glendale-Austin game, had him mic through the sound system. Like, you could hear him talk, you know, the players and all his calls and whatnot. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that's smart. It's just something that we're all used to, really. Um, yeah. and with American football and other sports, it's just it's just a normal thing. Yeah, like that. Um, Can I just call out one thing that about the announcers? Uh, Sean Davies was not using sportsmanship with Vili Tulatau. He was trying to save time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, it might have been both, but uh, you know, the, uh, the the Glendale fan just just set what was up. Uh, another player for me that that did great uh, was Reichert Hatting. Uh, mm-hmm. You know Beautiful that run dude. Try. That dude was out because of a concussion for seven weeks or seven games. So mm-hmm. eight weeks after uh, the first game, and he puts on. Two great performances in the semifinal and the final. That was just pretty ridiculous mm-hmm. for me. Uh, and you know, but try the lines, the tackling. I'm I'm honestly kind of surprised that uh, you know that that hadn't got passed over for MVP of the series too, because you know no no offense to uh, you know to Billy of uh, Billy of course, but it's just that I don't know. I, I felt like it's Especially like, given the fact that he got that try taken back, especially, uh, you know, there were some other instances in which he wasn't exactly the best player on the field, whereas Hatting, like you said, kind of came through in both games with huge splash plays that kind of put his team over the top. So, I don't know. I just I kind of saw him as more effective. I, I know he had the match against San Diego. Um, I think Villy's – the reason – I think Billy the – reason Billy was given the MVP was because of his overall performance. Yeah, Hatting was there, but from my point of view, Hatting was there in spurts, whereas Billy was there the whole time. Well, Billy, I mean, outside of outside of that fumble and kick fumble thing, <laughs> that was a truck. Never do that again. Please. Just don't do that again. Outside Please. of that, his performance in this game, what I they I don't think they do what they do without the work rate of that of that guy. Yeah. Also, to give him a little bit of slack on that kick, he is like twenty one years old. So, hey, he's a cap eagle to do now. Too much. You don't. He is a he is a cap eagle now. You don't do that crap. All right. We have standards. Please. <laughs> yeah. I'm my way. Let me tell you. Um. So. One of the things that's come up a lot this season is is scrummaging, right? Um, yes, uh, Blake Rogers made the championship series all fifth all fifteen at loose end. Well, the reality was um, no one else was. Any- I mean, the other loose heads were not. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, you, Khalif, you was, Ali, Khalif. Ali Khalif was pretty close, to be honest. But the performance that uh, Rogers did against Utah is one of the reasons why. Uh, oh wait, I'm the person that selects that stuff. I guess it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, all it's all <laughs> your fault. It's all your fault. Following up on your previous question, Aaron, I actually do think that um, one of the positions is that Glendale will need now is front row. Period, because they're losing yeah. Dylan Fawcett back to New York. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here's here's an interesting question. Um, I heard it wasn't announced. But I had heard that, uh, you know, is Zach done? Is, is that going to – I had heard that he might – this might have been his last game. So I would I don't, be surprised. I, which would surprise the hell out of me because he is playing his best rugby at any position he's played at mm-hmm. um, in years. Like there's – the only reason why he's not – I think he's probably not in uh, the Eagles – like – Circle is because of what he does full time. Mm-hmm. Which is a math teacher, by the way, for those of you that don't know. Oh, 
he is Finolio's not 32. He's, he's 29. He's on the same U20 team as Cam Dolan that won the Junior World Trophy. Just so Man. our viewers uh, understand, we have like a little side chat thingy, and we, we we often debate things and ask things, and there's a little spat over how old he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. So, um, I, 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 Zach, just give me your birth certificate. I'll fix it with whoever it needs to be fixed with. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, he's playing some of his best rugby, and he played he he put in a good shift too. But so the, the, I'm saying Metro versus Rogers. I think the, the battle between Fafita and Khalifi was really, uh, really, they were on par with each other. Uh, but Metro is something else. And there's a reason why he got voted as, you know, the top, top, um, top tight head uh, for the season. And yes, I know that uh, Paul Mullen is a tight head. But mm -hmm. there were eight people that voted, and they were the two props with the highest votes, and it wasn't even close uh, for the for the other two, which is Khalifi and Tucci, who were loose head, both loose head props. Although I'll point out that Khalifi can play tight head; he has done it a lot in the past. I I think I honestly think Luke White should have started that match. I, I thought Luke, Luke White is. I thought is Luke White should have started. Against Utah, yeah. So I, I think he's the better loose head on Glendale. I I think he is too, and I I think that was a uh, that's not what lost them the game, but I think that was a missed opportunity. Oh well. So um, so before we move on, scrum talk. <laughs> uh, I did want to share a couple things real quick. First, uh, we got an email in uh, this afternoon from uh, one of our listeners, Peter, who was at the match, and he sent in a couple uh, observations as well he just uh, wanted to share with us. So I thought maybe if you guys don't mind, just kind of buzz through this. So Peter was telling us that he's a pretty new, uh, new to the game. So he took a buddy of his that was a big uh, England rugby fan and that's uh, followed that team closely uh, and his friend recognized uh, Bobby Skinstad from South Africa and had a chat with uh, France France guys, yeah thank you from Bath um, so he goes on to say I'm sure there were other players that I just didn't recognize there are a lot of big guys around the Legion players were out in the crowd as well I also saw people representing DC and Los Angeles in the crowd uh, yeah, after the um, match at what and the last thing he says after the match they let people down on the field to hang out with the players i had a blast as a legion season ticket holder this year and can't wait for next season and then just says thanks for the podcast so peter uh happy to happy to provide it to you but thank you so much for sharing those thoughts we it's great that you're able to make it out and really glad to hear that you had a good time that's been one of the cool things this season is, I mean, I've only done it. It's only happened to me twice at Glendale and at San Diego, but that the players, you know, after they, you know, shake hands and cheer for each other and, you know, when they're done, they get to, they interact with the fans and the fans are allowed on the pitch to, you know, talk to these guys. And it lasts about 30 minutes, I think. And it was, it's, it's just really awesome for, uh, to, to, Fans don't get to do that in other sports. Uh, you don't have uh, – that I can tell. You know, I'm watching football forever. I don't remember uh, football players or baseball players of any kind going into the stands after all the time, like every single match, right, other than in high school, uh, to, you know, give their respect to the supporters, which is something I really in, have enjoyed about this season of Major League Rugby. Likewise. Likewise. But the, uh, what was it? Uh, the person from D.C. was Paul Sheehy, one of the co-owners from D.C. He, uh, his wife and his, I think, two daughters were out uh, to watch the game, so that was really cool. And then uh, Stuart Proctor was the one in uh, L.A. Uh, Coast Rugby stuff, so we'll talk about him a little bit later. But, uh, well, guys, when it counted... Seattle raised the America's Championship Shield in the inaugural 
grand final of Major League Rugby. Did, did anybody else notice when Stacy Pate said, S- lift that bad boy up, there was kind of a hesitation of players to see who was going to try to lift this, this uh, fat toddler pounds. into the air? <laughs> it's 80 pounds, man. It's mean, three of them, on, I think. think. Three or four I mean, of them. I'm just going to the, all just lift more than that in the gym. But. Just give it to the props and locks. Okay. Well, the, the issue is that it's uh, it's it's weird, right? It's like a it's like a really weird shape, and it's wide, yeah. and uh, so um, but you know, go big or go home. Uh, the Seattle Sea Wolves will get their name engraved on that. They get to hold on to it for a whole another year, and uh, don't know who's gonna get it. But I guess we'll have to do our uh, way too early preseason poll uh, when the when the other expansion teams are finally launched. Uh, and who was our player of the week? Or who was the MLR player of the week? Rather? Our MLR player of the week is Vili Tolatahu. Uh, so, for, so, so, you mentioned before. Cool fact about him. So You guys had the same watch? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's the same watch. It's the same he watch brand. So he was given... Uh, a Shinola watch, and sh- the Shinola watch company makes everything in Detroit. So, an American American watch for an American league. That's pretty dope. There you go. Um, yeah. Good old Detroit. Uh, so, I think, what else did we have? We have the MLR play of the week. And uh, so, as you guys saw in the rundown, I kind of gave... I gave props to two uh, plays in particular. First, uh, I, my almost winner was uh, was, was uh, Rikard Hatting's uh, try uh, in the second half. However, I had to give the actual uh, try or play of the week to Rosalika's try that, that he got in the left hand corner of the of the try zone. Uh, it came off a really nice offload from uh, Vili, uh, like you know uh, from Vili. I believe that it then went to Tiberio. Or no, it, no. It, it then went to Hatting, and then it went to Rosalika. It was just a really good display of passing in, a, in some tight places. It shows some really good chemistry, and that's why it's the MLR play season. The, and, that play and was... it also took ten minutes of TM. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that play was. Uh, you know that 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 try was instrumental in how this thing went down because. It was two minutes after uh, Bryce had scored a try. Uh, if if that didn't happen, um, I think that was the turning point in this game. To be honest, it definitely. I don't want to say it was the nail in the coffin because there was never a point where Glendale was, you know, like more than one score down. I believe, but it was definitely that the the moral nail in the coffin for Glendale when they realized that this game might actually be, you know, more or less out of, again, I don't want to say out of reach, but I think they realized they could actually lose this game that, you know, despite what everybody had been saying all season, that this is Glendale season to lose that, you know, the reality is that they're probably going to lose this game. And so they did. I think the the true nail in the coffin, because at two minutes, they had the ball at midfield, right? or a little, little between their 22 and midfield. And Will McGee, instead of running it, decides to put the ball down and kicks it and misses touch. They they still had the – I mean, they're Glendale, right? So we expect them to score. And as soon as he misses touch, it's over. So. Didn't they get it? Didn't he didn't- – um, Peter Smith kick it like right back out though. No, no, no. Like, uh, cause it was only two minutes left. It was collected. Oh yeah. Um, and then they kicked it one. out. They kicked it out after a ruck. It was like this ruck that was slow ball. It was that was a penalty and a half. But uh, you know, if someone's trying to jack over the ball still, um, uh, you know, I guess you're able to get away with that. <sighs> But um, so what were you guys' championship predictions? Because I put it on Super Brew. Uh, you know, after spending some time with the Sea Wolves, I 
I should have picked him. Uh, I, I should have, but I didn't. I, I said Glendale by one. And Captain then, uh, Hindsight. Yeah, well, yeah. I, well, the pick I put in Super Brew was Glendale by one. So I, I made the pick. I didn't put it in the I didn't put it in the show notes last week when I was gone, but I made the pick. So I got that wrong. But your guys' picks, Josh, what did you have? I had Glendale by five. I mean, they'd beaten them twice this season already. They to beat them in rainy Seattle. They um, scored 33 unanswered points against them in, Glen- in Glendale. And, I, you know, I figured it was going to be a closer game, but I thought Glendale was going to be able to take it. Yeah, That's I had – Oh, sorry, Liam. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I had Glendale by 14. It was uh... – Kind of like Jar said, they had beaten them all season, and I thought that Seattle, you know, a talented team though they are, I thought they just didn't play a style of rugby, and they didn't have, you know, I, I, I just didn't see them as a consistent enough team to actually get past Glendale's really, really fluid passing and great chemistry together. But uh, the amount of pressure they were able, able to apply on defense made all the difference. And so, yeah, uh, minus 14, that didn't fucking happen. And I was kind of right there with Josh. I thought it was going to be close, uh, but I did put Glendale by seven at the end of the day. Uh, but I think what we really need to talk about here is uh, Victor's pick. Yeah, that's right, guys. I got to see Wolves by 12. I was up I was up by the numbers, okay? But the point is that yeah, I picked the, I mean, the champion. You're, you're way off because you didn't cover. <laughs> no, no, but I picked the champion. <laughs> and all of you guys picked the Raptors. And I, and, and I said it last week that – I was I was I was going for the Raptors, but I said it's Sea Wolves because if they won, I was gonna close the, the next week. So I'm gloating right now. Well, so you did it to be petty. You did it out of spite. It wasn't a real yeah. prediction. No, just, a just to be a yeah, but hey, my pick ended up winning. So hey, you'd still lose in Vegas. Well, no, yeah, you'd still, still lose in Vegas. <laughs> still uh, well, lose a bunch of money in Vegas, baby. All right. Well, so here's we'll going to uh, here's can, can I make. Let me make just one quick point here, and this is something that I forgot to mention in the actual uh, recap, match recap. For me, and props to Victor for picking picking the championship, um, and I understand that the rest of us, we, we had plenty of evidence going into this that Glendale should have won the game, but uh, as I stand back and as I took a moment to just really look over the course of the season, for me, I think that Seattle winning is the perfect capstone for uh, the first season for, because they had a great story. If mm-hmm. you think about the team as a narrative, they had really that overcoming adversity. They you know, showed up every week. They didn't win every game, but you know what? They were right in the mix for most of them, and they were just kind of the – the train that just kept on, you know, little train that kept on going. They didn't stop. And so I, I kind of wish I had voted for uh, uh, Raptors to win in a way. I, I was being logical, and I should have followed my heart, which was uh, that they just maybe wanted it more. I don't know. I think there's some really neat stories I, in there, though. You know, I don't think it's at this – when you're at this level of the game – and you're in the grand final. I don't think it's about wanting it more because I saw tears of joy from, you know, guys like Ali Khalifi. And then I saw Will McGee slouched on his butt with his head in his hands crying tears of sadness because he knew he probably knew he he probably I don't know about knew he made a mistake he probably felt he made a mistake and the Glendale guys they wanted it right so well, I, I, and I, I, yeah. I think that I think that reaction has a lot to do with the expectations that were put on them I think you know I I, I think there's this element that Glendale Kind of, like we've been saying, they, they came into the season not just expected to win to the title, but it was kind of, you know, preemptively handed to them by everybody who knew anything about USA Rugby. And so when you say that Will McGee probably felt like he had made a mistake, I, 
you know, in a way that's almost like he, you know, he, he took away the, you know, a destiny for not just himself, but for his teammates and for the whole organization. And that's kind of an unfair expectation to put on yourself, especially considering, you know, all these teams were made up of extremely talented rugby players from, you know, tons and tons of, uh, you know, rugby playing communities and cultures. I, I do think that I do think Glendale kind of let it go to their heads. They had been around the longest. They'd been together the longest. They had the depth. They should have won. They thought they were going to win. I think the players in their head, like, we can just go in there and whoop these guys. Um, and then when that didn't happen, I'm crashing down. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It, so, wow. um, let's just move on to our uh, table review and well, I guess our preseason power poll, uh, per se. Uh, and... You know, I guess I was you know sort of wrong, um, well, way wrong. Uh, I had Glendale, Houston, New Orleans, Austin, San Diego, Utah, Seattle, and it ended up being, of course, Seattle winning the championship. Glendale second, uh, and then I guess we'll say uh, San Diego. Well, San Diego had the the most wins, so they'll take third, and Utah fourth, with uh, you know Austin uh, and Nola. And Houston bringing up the, the bottom of the barrel, uh, you know. It's. I know we're saying we could not have been more wrong about Seattle when we played. Uh, too much into the fact that they were now coached by committee by their own guys because and we gave them put up too much drama with that, but then someone said. Uh, the other night is look at their spine, right? Their spine is the the hooker, the eight, the nine, the ten, and the fifteen. And look at the experience that those guys had. Well, you know, Canadian International Ray Barkwell over fifty caps. Uh, Riker Haddock was in the Bulls system. His father is a Springbok. Uh, <laughs> at Scrum Half, you have Phil Mack. 50 cap international for Canada. I guess the weak point in their spine is at fly half. But you have, you know, one of the strongest spines out there in this league with Seattle. And really one of the strongest spines in the two strongest spines in this league were Glendale and Seattle. So, uh, moving on, I had um, Glendale, Houston, San Diego, Utah, NOLA, Austin, Seattle. So, I was right there with you. I had uh, Houston way too high and Seattle way too low. Uh, the middle actually was worked out okay. But, uh, yeah, if we could just swap those two, I think we would have been good. So. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, Victor, you go ahead. I'll go last. Sounds good. Well, for me, guys, I had Houston, Glendale, Utah, San Diego, Nola, Austin, and Seattle. Now, I, by the way, the, the positioning comes from episode 32, for those of you that were wondering. And um, the reason why I put Utah, and, and the reason why I think all of us did, was the fact that, one, Utah it was, was coming dead last in, in comparison to the other six teams in terms of play. They only had one game, and it was that a close game they had for, with the Alberta Wolfpack and for one. And and two, Houston was coming hot from the preseason. So we're all thinking if you took, Houston doesn't win the championship, at least they're going to go far. And you saw what happened. They, they had injuries. The players were uh, burned out. And they ended up only winning one game. And Seattle, which was the freshest of all teams, it came in second in the stands and ended up winning the, the whole thing. So it was, um, it, it was, it was quite funny. It was really funny for my part, I have to say. So go ahead, not Dan. Me, not Dan. <laughs> not Dan. Not Dan. Not Dan. With, uh, were, are these my? Are these Dan's predictions? Yeah, not Dan. Yeah, these are Dan's predictions. <laughs> 
All right, so if uh, if I'm gonna be Dan, all right, I'm from New York. I love everything New York. I love the Mets. Okay, <laughs> so um, let's see. My uh, my preseason predictions were Glendale, Houston, Utah, San Diego, Seattle, Nola, and Austin. So uh, overall, I guess you know it not awful. I mean, if like kind of like uh, Victor said, if you switch Houston and Seattle, it's not in, entirely far off. Uh, you know, but no, nobody saw Houston only winning one game coming. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, the amount of stress they put on their bodies with that huge ass preseason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I I you know they'll remain nameless. I've talked to a few Houston SaberCat players who definitely felt that was the uh, proper sentiment there. Uh, live and learn. Live and learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, so um, I had Glendale, Houston, Nola, Utah, Joe Austin, and Seattle. I came up with the idea of an MLR journalist poll just so we could have some more content to throw out. And we all agreed that it was a good idea. And going into it, most of us put Seattle last or near last because of the lack of information and all of the drama. Corey was right. We probably should have looked past that. But based on the information we had is where we put them at that time. Yeah, you can question our decisions now, as many of you have. Yeah, but everybody's based- kept in hindsight right now. Seriously, yeah. hindsight's twenty twenty. But yeah. well, and this the, is the other thing to remember about that had at the time. The other thing to remember about that poll was that was not just you know the four or five of us sitting here making this stuff up. It was the five of us plus uh, fifteen other people. It was about twenty people weighed in on that poll, and these are you know folks who've been following the rugby scene in the U.S. for quite a long time. So obviously we make mistakes, but we also base our information on the best information we have, or our responses on the best information we have at the time. So that's kind of, I don't know, that's where it came from. And uh, I, it's quite clear now why we were wrong. We didn't, I, I don't think we understood what Seattle was capable of, clearly. I mean, obviously we weren't. Uh, so, yeah. I think well, I think it was definitely... Here. I think there was definitely that feeling that Seattle had all the pieces to be good, you know, especially when you have somebody like Ray Barkwell in the front row, uh, you know, but I, I think, again, it was, you know, the fact that they didn't really have a preseason, they were kind of in, <laughs> they were kind of in flux, uh, you know, with, with the whole immigration issues with their coach and Phil Mack had to step in at the, at the last minute. And if, if I remember correctly, I think there was this feeling as well that a late season uh, resurgence, uh, as opposed to kind of starting off hot the way they did. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was to be expected, you know, like why Seattle was ranked the way they were, but I think they, you know, they climbed quickly, uh, up the rankings, you know, enough once people kind of, uh, you know, saw that they were, they weren't just, uh, you know, going to be dust in the wind in this league for this season. I, yeah, I mean, for the most part, this team was, you know, built uh, around a core group of Seattle Sanderson's that had played together for multiple years. Uh, and then you, the rest of the team, outside some odds and ends like Metcher and Peter Smith and Will Holder, the, the rest of this, the rest of the team was put together of the best in the BC Premier League. So all those guys had known each other. So talent wise. They, they had it. Like, I think before we were talking about them being able to, you know, be a top two team in the league, you know, before all the drama happened. So, mm-hmm. that, I mean, we weren't, they were, you know, we felt they were, you know, they were up there. And then, you know, they didn't have preseason matches. Uh, you know, Visa was denied for their coach. And then they tried to get another coach in, and they were unable to do that, and everything fell on, you know, Phil and then some of the other older guys. And, you know, uh, every time, uh, you, you, you know, you look at Phil Mack, and he's, his, he's got these icy blue eyes. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the Little Wayne song. <laughs> you know, where he's like, uh, you know, ice in my veins. Aaron, you've been very poetic tonight. You know, icy blue eyes, ice in my veins, sitting on the ground, crying, 
Uh, well, uh, it was a very, uh, it's been a very poetic couple of weeks. <laughs> so yeah, he's, the man's got ice in his veins and I think that if he wants to, he could be, you know, the, uh, when he's done playing, he could put himself on the path to be hopefully the next Canadian head coach of the national team. Uh, because I think he's got that kind of talent. And I think the other guys around him also have that kind of talent too, to coach. Like we're talking about uh, not everyone can be a player coach and not everyone can be a player head coach. And this guy was able to manage that. So what are the chances that Phil Mack, you know, transitions into being a full-time head coach as to be, as opposed to being a player for Seattle next, next year? No. I think he's I, – I think with what's going on, they're going to bring in a well-qualified head coach that will mesh with the current player – with the player culture, which is one of excellence, right, and will play to their talents because um, that just removes so much pressure off the player group, right? Um, and I think Phil Max – I think Phil's got – two or three good years of good rugby if he wants it. If he doesn't and he wants to retire, that's a different question. I don't think he wants to retire. He's only 32, 33. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Which in American rugby years is not that old. No, because most of us play – most of us start – the average start for the American ruggers is 22 years old. So, um, if, if about, anybody ever played in an alumni game, you've played with some old ass ruggers. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean, I if he wants to, I don't, I don't see him stop stopping play right now. That's, I mean, that's the only reason why I think he wouldn't become the a full time head coach. I think is because he's he's going to play for a couple of years, and he, he's one of those players where you've watched for a couple of years, and he's been on the national team, starts captains. Uh, he's had his his best rugby has been right now, which is great, which is which is important, and that's why you know they're on top of being a coach, uh, his play is the reason why they won the championship. You know, one of the. All right, guys, so going back with um with our uh, commentator Stephen again. Thank you, Stephen, for your questions. Uh, not really a question, but he's, he's his statement is team culture matters, which is. Which is definitely true of this um, Seawolves uh, outfit, especially now that they won the championship. Yeah, but to be honest, I don't think their culture was that different than any other team. Yeah, well, each team has their own individual culture, but I don't think you can say that one team's culture propelled them more know. than another team's did. Well, yeah, I, I'm yeah. not. I don't. I don't think it's that. I think you have. Uh, you know, someone says like, hey, you know, the Saracens have this culture. They've had this culture of winning. Well, you look at Glendale and you look at uh, Seattle and you're looking at player groups that have been in this, this culture of winning. Where winning has been a habit for a very long time. And so I, I would say that the strongest player cultures, the strongest performance cultures, the cultures of winning are the two teams – that were in the final. I think that's what Steven is trying to say. Uh, I don't think the player cultures were what determined, uh, you know, who, who, the, who won. I think it was uh, just the right plays at the right time in the right circumstance led to, you know, this team that we doubted all season win. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we also need to uh, just take a moment when we're talking about cultures and not talk about the player culture, but talk about the fandom culture. And, I mean, Seattle showed up for this team. Oh, my God, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I, I think that helps. I, I think they traveled very, very well to San Diego from everything that I've heard. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it looked like – so they traveled well to Glendale. Right. I think they had 300 people there, probably at least in jerseys. Um, but there were more. Uh, and I, I tweeted it. I said, I think this feels like a, uh, this feels like a Seattle home game. I, I didn't hear any Raptors chants until like the last 10 minutes of the game. So, um, I will believe that. 
Well, let's close that door and enter another court tweet of the week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So tweet of the week, uh, understandably, is all about Seattle. So uh, we grabbed a couple of them here, and so I'm going to go through both of them. The first one is from earlier today, and it was uh, Seattle themselves posted, uh, started unknown, finished unforgettable, and then trophy. We couldn't have been this we couldn't have been this without the support of the best fans in the US MLR. Thank you to all our supporters from Washington to Wales to Western Australia for making our first season a championship one. Hashtag hunted. Uh, so that was, you know, kind of sort of where we just were, given props where props are due. And Seattle really showed up. The city showed up for its team. And I think that's very evident in the second tweet we grabbed. And thank you, Josh, for reminding me of this. Um, following Seattle's win this weekend, uh, they actually got a shout out from the Se Seattle Seahawks, who tweeted, way to cap off an amazing system or <laughs> amazing season with the MLR championship. Big congrats, Seawolves. Clapping hands, trophy. Hashtag Seattle love. Hashtag together we hunt. So, yeah, uh, it wasn't just Seattle. It was the entire, uh, it wasn't just the Seawolves. It was the entire sporting community, and it was everybody up there. So congratulations to Seattle. It's well-earned, and uh, hey, way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you and yeah. the, the Seahawks got in the action, which is really cool. So let's move on to... Um, my favorite uh, segment where I get where I tend to get beat up a lot. <laughs> Views, news, and abuse. So, LA Coast Rugby, it's definitely a thing. I had the pleasure of chatting with Stuart Proctor, the one of the co-founders of uh, LA Coast Rugby. Uh, they have no intent of running an exhibition season. Uh, they uh, or in a period of exclusivity like DC is with uh, uh, the league. And I think I spoke with Paul Sheehy for Washington. I think they're, they've made their decisions on their period of exclusivity and they will move forward with uh, negotiating final terms uh, for their entrance. I think it's going to be in, in 2020. But LA Coast Rugby, they're ready to go. Uh, they've done all their player scouting, even though player scouting is continuous. They have um, five different directors of rugby resumes, uh, candidates that are being vetted. Uh, the, the pool was a lot bigger than that, but they're going to do the final interviews and then appoint a director of rugby. Uh, then they'll hire uh, a rugby staff. and then. But the first hire that he told me was that they will make – is their commercial director because they are going to run a business. So um, says a lot. Uh, they've been very uh, collaborative with the local rugby community. Stuart Proctor is, uh, you know, I think he's the head coach of the St. Clemente Tritons youth program, specifically the high school side uh, at San Clemente high school. So uh <sighs> They are the, they're deep when it comes to their community ties in Los Angeles and the Orange County area. And they plan to be uh, pulling from the Inland Empire. So you include San Bernardino and Riverside County and also from further out in Ventura County. So they're going to be a five. They look to have their area as those five counties, which is a massive metropolitan area of almost 15 million, no, almost 20 million people. Um, but they plan to be collaborative community outreach and all that stuff. Uh, Houston will break ground on their new facility on July 24th. The new renderings look Ooh. pretty awesome. Um, although I asked where they put riff raff like me, I didn't mean the press box. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I think we there's that spot under the, uh, yeah, there's a grassy knoll. There's a grassy knoll. Under, you, you, you can uh, spill your something. beer and, and stuff like that there. So, yeah, I'll, I'll meet you over there. And <laughs> uh, Fall MLR 7s was a topic uh, on Reddit this week, and my first question is why? Uh, because – Because I, fun. Be, be, why do you hate fun, Aaron? <laughs> I, I want 
I want us focused on the things that, you know, the, the things, the things are rugby 15s. However, I could see uh, in the future an MLR sevens tournament weekend, which the premiership does. So that could be pretty cool. Uh, but it's interesting. Nola gold is running a sevens pro summer sevens program uh, this year. And then the sea wolves, all those boys, basically the entire back line registered for the Washington athletic club. <laughs> so, and if you include bulldog, there's at least three different all, all and tigers. So like four fully professional uh, sevens programs out there competing in club sevens this year. Uh, America's championship shield, go big or go home. Yes. No. Maybe. Mm, I like it. It's different. I like it. It's yeah. It's unique. Um. But 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 guys, we need to think about this. What happens when the Canadian teams come? It has to be uh, Americas. Yeah. yeah. Uh. But the well, in between the A and the S. Well, it, it's it's North it's North America, South America. It's it's the America. Mm, um, I told you, bro. And you were like, no, Victor, that's too dangerous. You can't have it in Tijuana. That's a crap hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Tijuana, Tijuana is a place where, at least when I was in the Army, I couldn't go. So, yeah. <laughs> look, um, uh, look, as long as they, they, as long as they use their money and they, take, and they use it to take out all the drug cartels, and once that happens, then they could have the rugby team. Yeah. So, um, and then one of the final things on that is LA Coast will f will host the Ontario Arrows in the preseason in December. Mm -hmm. So that is how close next season already is. Oh mm -hmm. my god! Uh, so moving on to questions from Bob Corey. Bab, bab. All right. Uh, I want <laughs> so you guys we might. Uh... Yeah, I might be doing some editing as we go along because we have got a crap ton of questions, um, and I'm not sure we got time for all of them. But let's start us off. So, uh, Downey Keen wants to know: Do you think there will be any rebranding from the current seven clubs between season one and season two? So, anybody changing their name? Yeah, Austin uh, Elite is. Thank Austin you. Elite Austin Elite you. is supposed to. Please. Yeah, I, I, I uh, a couple of weeks ago, I even, I even commented on one of their statuses saying, you know, being like, hey, do you think you guys would keep the elite name now that you know people are starting to kind of get used to it? And they were like, no. Uh, they were, they were like, well, if we did, what do you think we, you would call it? And I, I don't know, I said something generic like the rustlers or something like that. But yeah, I, I, I think, I, I think ever what Austin, that could be all right, Austin rustlers. Yeah, but Austin, I think Austin Horsley. <laughs> Austin, Austin. <laughs> but anyway, I think ever since they kind of had that definitive split with the Huns organization, that um, that they are looking for their own identity. So I think you know Austin Elite was just kind of a placeholder, the, a Josh McGowan kind of name, if you will, uh, before they actually get something that fans can sink their teeth into. So um, okay, well, yeah, so. Uh, Downey also asked another question regarding uh, the Glendale Raptors, whether they would be interested in changing from Glendale to Denver as their name, identifying as the larger city. They Don't should, but they won't. Until they have to move. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think most people, when they think of Glendale, will think of either Arizona or California. Mm -hmm. And when you explain to them that it's – the only rugby purpose facility in the United States as of now. Um, they are nicknamed Rugby Town USA. Yeah, the, Glendale does some marketing for it, but I don't think they do enough, to be honest. Like, when you have people asking where you are, why you're named that, you think you need to put a little bit more into marketing. All right. Um, Good point. Next one. Yeah. Uh, Karma Killer 95. What's the biggest change that you believe MLR needs to make going into 2019? I think, guys, that all games should have TMO. I know it's still a long shot, but I think all games should have TMO. Um, so do we have to go to the um, soccer style with the TV on the sideline? Uh, you mean football style? F football Whatever. Style. Uh, NFL. Uh, I well, think no, 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 no. 
it, they have vo- they have video assistant referee now in soccer and in, in where the fourth official stands, they have a, a TV and the, in some of the matches they'll go over and watch. Well, I don't I don't think I mean I don't think the location of the the, the TMO. Match. Well, I, I just mean just because San Diego and Glendale are the only ones with jumbotrons. Yeah, yeah. Well, I. Capability for TMO needs to be on site. So, for if there's a facility that doesn't have a jumbotron, they need to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, a little screen or something. Uh, you know, I've I've probably taken this shot about ten times. We need to professionalize the refing. Um, I know that I've we've had this discussion on air with Brian Ray, and he thinks that uh, MLR doesn't need to do anything other than provide the rest opportunities. I disagree. Uh, that is one area that this can like really improve the product is if all of these refs got paid a good wage to where they can dedicate the amount of time necessary to completely hone their skills. That's my, um, well, I mean, it took the NFL forever to give, uh, you know, to make any referees full time. So, well, they, all those guys are part time and they're making like over 50 K. So, I don't, yeah, well, they're already all rich ass lawyers and doctors and stuff yeah, like so, that. I mean, business executives. It's uh, that like there's no reason to make those guys full time because they're all you know, Ed Hockley runs a major practice in Phoenix and makes millions of dollars a year as a lawyer. Mm-hmm. So. I can tell you the one thing I would like to see MLR change uh, between season one and season two is to add a Midwest team, but. Uh, I think the chances that continue to diminish with every single day that goes by. So, yeah, um, yeah, Town's not looking too uh, too promising right now. Yeah, nor is Kansas City. Also, guys, another thing to better set pieces. Um, better set pieces. Yeah, on so the field or, line out or do you want people to run out of the tunnel to like music and lights and smoke and shit? <laughs> no, seriously. Right. They, the line now was scrums. I mean, th- there was a lot of inconsistency between between them. So, so when it comes to when it comes to lineouts and the thing that like just I've said it a million times. Uncontested lineouts. Stop it. Stop that shit. Contest the lineout every time. All right. the, only, the only time I can see uh, an acceptable uncontested lineout is five meter lineout when you're defend when you're going to defend the mall. Oh yeah, it's the sure. only time I see it acceptable. So, um, mm. any other changes for the next season? Yeah, uh, Boston. You want you want a Midwest team? I want a, I, I want a team. All right, I want I want a team that I can be loud and obnoxious about supporting and. Uh, and there's a lot more issues surrounding the creation of a Boston team than purely what's going on in the MLR. Like the the city of Boston itself needs to get its clubs together and actually figure out getting together elite talent. Because there's a lot of people on the Mystic River Rugby team who would not be uh, going pro uh, should the MLR come that way. So I just, Liam, I just... Liam, I'm now granted I'm not from the East Coast, obviously. You know, being an Iowa boy here, mm-hmm. but like. Uh, if there's going to be a New York team, isn't that good enough? I mean, New York, Boston, are basically the same thing. I'm, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, <laughs> what? No, no, it's not basically the same thing. No, it's not. I'm That's gonna wake up my roommates. You're getting me so angry, man. Come on now, you know it's not the same. Thing. Heaven, heaven, <laughs> listen to this, heaven. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. We've got a question from from Blurins, Blurinsky. 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 Loransky wants to know, given 10 teams next season, what would be your preferred format uh, for the year? And I, I'm not so, sure what he means. Uh, East-West division. division. I don't so know. You yeah. got, I would so like you that. got 10 teams. Can you do the conferences already by 10? You could, but I don't want to. You, yeah, um, yeah. you could do home and away. Yeah, that's true. You could. I'm not a big fan of home and away in general. But if 18, I hope I want 18 to be like your max magic number, right? <laughs> so 18 is your max magic number. Um, or you go 14, which is a split schedule somehow. Um, if you went conferences, you could do 12, I think. No. Yeah, if you went conferences, you could do 12 
where you played your conference opponent twice and then you played the other conference just for, or, you know, you just played four, four of those guys. So that's a – either way, it's sort of a mixed, unequal schedule, I think, is what we're going to well, be seeing. I could see 14 because I think most teams have – I think we've heard most teams are going seven home games, at least from the ones that have been announced. So you could do the conference system where you do home and home against your four. You have one matchup against the other conference home and away, and then you just play the other teams, two of them home and two of them away. Yeah. I mean, well, so Seattle said seven and Utah said eight. So I guess you could definitely play – uh, you know, your conference. Uh, no, that would still not get you to 15, though. So I don't know. But, yeah. So uh, some que- sub-question off of that, though. Um, I've heard some speculation saying that we could be looking at ha- playing the first half of the season at away games for the northern teams and then having home games up north. Who's, the- who's saying that? I, like, no, one, no one is saying that. Um, who is they? Who is they? <laughs> Whoever they are, they are the enemy. Because the reality is, is just because they're cold weather, the cold weather doesn't stop them from playing. I think the only team yeah, I, I play in Vermont. Believe me, I know what playing in cold weather is like. It's it's fucking doable. <laughs> uh, you, playing in snow is fun. The only team that could you know would have an issue, I think, is. The worst one would be Ontario, but for the most part, as long as it's not a blizzard, Denver's right. The Glendale's fine. Like the Denver area is, you know, not in the mountains. Yes, they're a mile high, but the mountains are fifteen thousand feet where the snow is. It's not. It's it's, it's not going to be a problem. Hmm. There you go. Good answer. So. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, final question of the night. This is coming from uh, Stephen off of our YouTube comments. So thank you so much. Uh, we've had a lot of great comments tonight, by the way. Uh, both William and Stephen have been hanging out with us, so thank you guys. Stephen asked earlier, what do you want to see next season uh, in next season's MLR Championship Shield match? So uh, I'm going to go with meaning who do I want to see. Um so who do you guys want to see playing in that game? Glendale again and hopefully winning the championship this time. I'd I'd want to see either Glendale versus Rooney or Houston Sabercats versus anybody because I just want to see I want to see the Sabercats in the finals. I think the the great storyline would be the Sabercats versus Seattle. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you, oh. have the, you have the winner versus the bottom of the table, mm-hmm. and then you have all the the subplots of Coach Fitzpatrick being the former Saracens coach and going up against like ten of his former players, and you know all the drama that that would be incurred with that matchup. I I, I kind of want to see Rooney in LA, just because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just because. Exactly. I, I want to see. I want to see JBL, like you know, John Bradshaw Layfield, come out onto the rugby pitch in, in the limo that he used to come out into his matches with. <laughs> Have all the players get out <laughs> yep. of the limo. Got to get the stock market bell too. Ding 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 ding. I forgot how his thing song goes. You know, I like how you guys talk about. You know, funny that that Liam mentions JBL. And you guys talking about storylines because the way Aaron just put that in my head, it just sounded like wrestling. That just sounded like wrestling. So it was, <laughs> it was really cool. I think a coach ostracized by his former players. Exactly. The new coming team. Yeah. Not, I mean, that sounds like a WWE storyline, really. I mean, you gather the bottom, the the, the bottom team coming uh, next season coming to. To play against the champion and that their coach used to coach the, the, the guys that won and it's, it's, that sounds like a wrestling storyline. But but at what point does Roman Reigns get shoved down your throat against your will? Damn it! You tell me. And then we go to the starting. Uh, it's the starting chanting. He, uh, yeah, what's it? Uh, what's it chanting always when he said, comes out? You suck! You suck! I think that's the one. <laughs> okay, guys, we'll save it for uh, the. Uh, 
pro wrestling uh, podcast we'll do later. <laughs> uh, a couple awesome. ideas that came in from comments. Uh, Steven said he would love to see next season uh, at the championship game, no empty seats. So there's a good one, yeah. I was yeah. a little disappointed. There was some. There was more empty seats than I thought there was going to be. There was definitely more empty seats than you know a few uh, than a few uh, San Diego Legion games, and so that was a little disappointing. So I mean, major props to Seattle fans for traveling and you know looking some, good for TV. Some of that has to do with the beer policy. Yeah, right, dude. I would totally go fucking drink that shit in the bar, man. <laughs> Well, that's that's the only place you could drink it. You couldn't get it and go back to your seat. You had to stay in the beer garden to drink your beer. So, yeah, part of, I mean, why it looks empty is you have uh, like a hundred people in the be- in each beer garden during during the game. So you had tons of people in the VIP beer garden uh, drinking in the corner. Are <laughs> rugby fans known for drinking or something? I mean, I think we're known for for drinking and still being polite. <laughs> hey, impolite, when, impolite when, you know, there's always that one guy on the teams. Mm-hmm. Well, you need that one guy though, because when when somebody doesn't want to leave the rugby house and you don't want to be impolite, you're like, all right, dude. <laughs> hey, when your club team slogan is "win or lose, we booze," uh, maybe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> every, every club has that one alcohol inspired cheer that you do after practices night practices only so that the administration's not there to hear it <laughs> the uh the final observation was from william and he said he would really like uh to drop the neutral site final so i disagree i uh, disagree i liked it Although I, I I want to see instead, but I want to see instead. So we're going to ten teams. Let's say let's do a sixteen playoff. Let's do. Uh, so a bye two. week. Give somebody a bye. Yeah. So first and second seed get a bye. Uh, so you have first round versus uh, what was it? So it'd be the three versus the six, and the four versus the five, and then they play. For to go where to go to the first and second seeds home field. I think we do away with the, it, it's all based on operations costs and the event the eventing you can do. But I think next year that changes a lot with uh, the SaberCats having their own facility uh, that will be brand new. So uh, you know there may be some shifts in the playoffs. I I do want to see um, eventually if we can get enough interest. It, going to like Rio Tinto or Avaya in San Diego or um, exporting to the Colorado. Avaya in San Diego. San Jose. God damn it. My bad. Or um, yeah. I, I think, man, if Utah's in the playoff, if Utah's in the final and it was at Rio Tinto, 10,000. Mm-hmm. Seeing it happen. That would be great. No, we could if it happened right there. All right. Well, guys, final thoughts. Uh, I have a team to root for now, guys. Ooh, the LA team. It's going to take it forever. You weren't rooting rooting for San Diego before? Yeah, seriously? Mm. Uh, No. We thought thought you were a CSL fan. I was definitely a Houston fan. But, yeah, there's that. Uh, But, yeah, go Coast, go LA Coast Rugby. Um, You know, hometown team. So, might as well – Get on that bandwagon. Um, well, well, it hasn't left the station yet. And then, uh, so we're going to do some sevens promotional stuff. I've got, uh, we're going to do two interviews with, uh, what was it, Kayvon, Kayvon, Kayvon? Is, oh, no, Kevon Williams, Kevon Williams. Kevon Williams and Natalie Costco. So that look for that to hit the pod later on this week and early next week. Uh, I think, yeah. Taking a break next week, then we'll come back after Rugby World Cup sevens. Talk some some Houston cool news and some Rugby World Cup sevens because I'm going. I don't know mm. why, but I'm. I know why I'm going, but it's like going to going to a three day tournament where I know I'm gonna gonna need to like train my liver. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we're. You, you ever want to? Tra- if you ever want to train, come on up to Vermont, man. I'll show you a thing or two. 
Yeah, yeah. So that means guys will be back by July twenty third. Uh, and then the intent is to take a break for a while after that. So um, we'll have more information on that following Rugby World Cup sevens. Sounds cool. Go USA. But suffice it to say, I think uh, a break's good because we've got some stuff cooking. We've got some ideas marinating. We're going to fry them up and see what comes out the other end. So, uh, yeah, look forward to that. And uh, I think we've got a great season two ahead of us, not only for MLR, but also for Earful of Dirt. So for those of you who are hoping, sorry, guys, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're sticking around for a while. That's right. I just need a, we just need a vacation. It's okay. But um, Everybody we're gonna have, does. We're going to have some content on the lineouts uh, come out through August. So check that out as well. Um, but uh, I will also be coming out with some more uh, interviews on my my blog. You could find on Facebook, Penguin Tundra Rugby. Uh, you know, every now and again, I do some inter- some player interviews, get some good info, some good stuff to read. So you'll be able to find that by me in the coming weeks. Cool. Also, guys, um, something that I, that I should have wrote in the um, news views and interviews section. It's the fact that um, Rugby United in New York already opened up their uh, open up for people that want to buy season tickets for the 2019 season. Um, you put a deposit of $100, and once the season tickets uh, are open for actual purchase, uh, it will be a lot cheaper for the people that do that. So if you are... <laughs> oh, so close. <laughs> Oh, all man. Right. All, right. You're so all right. Let's just let's let's get out of here. Finish all right. Here. Subscribe to our channel, YouTube, Earful of Dirt Podcast. Like us on Facebook at Earful of Dirt. Same on okay. Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. We're back. Well, check out our brand new website. It's not really brand new. Earful of Dirt.com. Bob, I know you asked about the uh, lawsuit. Uh, I submitted another records request. We'll see if I get an update. Uh, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Acast, Google Play, Stitcher, Player FM. Leave us a review. Also, call us 720-600-2679. Leave a voicemail, whether it's abuse or compliment. We will listen to it. And we are done. Nope, you forgot something. Remember, guys, follow us on our channel on YouTube. You're full, you're full of their podcast. You didn't mention that. I said it's that applied. before you got back on. <laughs> oh, the, oh! The, wait a minute! Did I went out? I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, yes. Did I went out? I didn't notice. Yes. Yeah, you, you, you were oh. gone for a while, man. Oh, dude, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, That's why. Alive. Oh man, finish it. You, you were gone for the whole show, actually. We were just. Nah, nah, nah. You guys alive. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Awesome.